Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you that's present here in the auditorium. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up, we can be a real inspiration to you. And as we said many, many times, you in the radio listening audience, if you'd get on your phone and call a friend, a shut-in friend, and have them to tune in and get this hour, then we'll try to be an inspiration to them. You'll be doing them a favor and us as well. We appreciate that so very much. I preached some time ago on top of Mount Calvary. I have that sermon on a record. On the other side, I have seven of Jones' beautiful organ solo numbers. That's been many years ago when I preached on Mount Calvary. And I've been in this Canaan land many times. I've been over there 11 times. And I'm looking forward to going back again on, in March of next year. And it's a wonderful trip, a trip of a lifetime. A lady called me the other day and said, Preach Edwards, I'm 65 years old. Am I too old to go? Absolutely not. We had people over there to go with us more than 80 years old. And if you've reached retirement age, senior citizen, never taken a trip of this type, then it'd be a real trip of a lifetime. And we're now getting our group together to go. Now's the time to get your name on the list and make preparation to go to the Holy Land in March. Maybe some of you visitors here today or some of you out in the radio listening audience, you might be interested in this trip. I'll be glad to provide you a brochure telling you what it'll cost you, where we'll be going, and when we leave, when we get back, and a lot of information that I know you would really be interested in. We'll be going to Jordan and Israel and Egypt and many, many wonderful places in these lands. So write in and get a brochure. Uh, if you're visiting here today and like to have one, let me know at the close of service. If you'd like to drop by my home and pick up one or call me on the phone, we'll do everything we can to help you in this trip. If your pastor's never been, it'd be good to send your pastor, your pastor and his wife. One of the greatest Christmas presents you could ever give them would be to send them to the Holy Land. And then talking about Christmas presents, maybe some of you wondering, what can I get mother and dad, a grandmother and grandfather for Christmas? Do they have a cassette tape recorder? That's just a suggestion. Now, we have many, many wonderful tapes, sermons, and music today that's available. And if they don't have a cassette tape recorder, get them one so they can listen to these tapes. I have listed here 148 of my own tapes. I have about another 100 I don't have listed here, at least another 100. And I'd be glad to send you this list. If you write in for it, these tape will be available for a gift of $3 for each tape, and the gift is used to help take care of the need of this radio ministry, pay for radio time and so forth. And you write for yours today, write for the brochure. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. And if you write to me, I appreciate it very much. I'm going to read today from the Bible in two different places. I'm reading from Psalms chapter 92, if you care to turn there, Psalms 92. And then I'm reading from Matthew chapter 12. Psalms 92 and Matthew chapter 12. I have about 8 or 10 original Schofield Bibles in my study. If you're interested in a Schofield Bible for Christmas time, I can save you about $10 on these Bibles. I have one large print Schofield Bible. You don't usually get a hold of large prints. I have one. And I have one large print Bible that's not a Schofield, just a, a regular Bible. But I only have these two large prints and then I have the others. If you're interested, you might uh, contact me. And I'm not in the Bible selling business, but since I have a few in my study that I can help you at this time of the year, if you're thinking about one for Christmas, I'd be glad to do so. Psalms uh, chapter 92, verse 1, page 645 in the original Schofield Bible. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy love kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night. Upon instrument of ten strings, and upon this altar, and upon the harp, 
with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hand. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the weak is spring is the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. Now, if you notice here in verse 6, it says, A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. Now, turn, will you please, to uh, the book of Luke, chapter 12, page 1092. Luke 12, page 1092, beginning with verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought with himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to restore my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I restore my fruits and my goods. I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thy fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself as not rich uh, toward God. Now if you notice in verse 20, God said, Thy fool. Now I'm speaking this morning on this thought, some fools in God's sight. There's a lot of fools in the land today. There's a lot of fools in the land during the days of Jesus. There's a lot of foolish people today doing foolish things. Now I want to mention some of these. I'm not standing here calling you a fool. I'm telling you what God said in this book. And of course, if it fits you, then if the shoe fits, you'll have to wear it. Now let me read this to you. I picked this up somewhere the other day. Uh, entitled, Two Fools. Now listen to it as I read it. Two fools had cause they thought perfection. They met one day at an intersection. They tooted their horns and made connection. A Polish car came and made an inspection. An ambulance came and made a collection. All this is left in recollection. And two less votes in the next election. And we might add there were two graves more in a cemetery section. Now you have a lot of fools on the highway today. A man that'll get drunk or get on dope or a woman and get in the automobile and drive down the highway as much traffic as we have today and as many lives as you have on the roads today, that man or that woman is a fool, according to the Bible. Now, just this past week, we heard about three different cases where people stopped to fix something or maybe a tie on their automobile and killed in three different places. Now, if you would check out those situations, I would assure you that there was alcohol involved in most of those cases one way or the other. Last night, someone hit a car, knocked it off the road. The man went down in the bank and it killed him. And the person that hit the car just kept moving on. I guarantee there's alcohol involved there. Now, you'd be surprised at the people today that are driving while drinking or while on dope. You're making a fool out of yourself. And you're killing people on the highways. And God's going to hold you responsible. A person that will drink and drive or get under strong dope and drive is a fool. I don't care who he is. And if you get on the highway and you kill some innocent person, you're guilty of murder. If you get drunk and drive down the highway or get on dope and drive down the highway and you're responsible for killing some innocent person, you ought to be tried for murder and sent to the electric chair. I don't care who you are. You're just as guilty of murder as a man that pulls a gun and pulls a trigger and shoots down his fellow man. You ought to have more sense than do a thing like that. You'd be surprised at the teenagers today that drink and drive. You're headed in the wrong direction. You're playing the fool. Any teenager that's listening to me today that you have an automobile, you have driver's license, your mother and dad work hard that you might get an automobile, maybe you worked and earned your own car, and then you drank and get on the steering wheel, you're a fool. I don't care who you are. You, you're, you're flirting with death and you're flirting with killing people and you're flirting with breaking the hearts of your parents and going to a premature grave. There's many of a young boy and girl today out in the cemetery because they dared to drink and drive. 
I was yonder in Danville, Virginia a few years ago. There lay in the hospital a young man laughing, talking, caring on his usual. I visited the pastor and the pastor said, uh, uh, Brother Edwards, I want to tell you something about that boy. He said, it's very sad indeed. He said, here some few weeks ago, he and his girlfriend, a fine Christian young teenage girl from a Christian home, the only child of the parents, were out riding around on Sunday afternoon. Nothing wrong in that, of course. But he said they drove up to a place where teenagers gather on Sunday afternoons in their automobiles and talk and laugh. And said that boy and another boy began to argue about which car could outrun the other. Of course, he started the automobile. She couldn't get out. And they started racing down the highway up to 50, 75, 100, 90, 100 miles an hour. And that sweet Christian girl out of that family, the only child in the family, got out on her knees in the floorboard of that car and began to pray and beg that young boy to stop. Said, stop, you're going to kill us. He went on and had a wreck and killed her instantly. There he lay in the hospital. His body kind of broken up somewhat, but he didn't seem to be worried about it. I don't know what they did to him. They might have taken his license away from him about 30 days, according to the law in this nation and in many of our states today. But there's a young man committed cold-blooded murder. He killed that young girl. He was a fool and a fool indeed. Now, let me ask you a question. We are human, and if that had been your daughter, knowing that she was a good Christian girl, got out on her knees and begged that boy not to uh, keep speeding that automobile, pleaded with that boy to let her out before he started and he wouldn't do it. And they had the wreck and she was killed. And that was your daughter. Uh, how would you feel about that? I'll tell you exactly how I'd felt before God saved me. If I could have got to that hospital room, got a hold of that young man, there wouldn't have been much left of the fellow. I guarantee you there wouldn't have been much left of him. It would have been a greater hospital bill or a new cemetery lot. I mean that in the depths of my heart. That was back before God saved me. Now, if that should happen now, I don't know what I'd do. Now, all my daughters are grown, of course, but I have granddaughters. And something like that happened, I, just, I don't know what I'd do. I just have to stay away from the, the boy that was guilty and involved. I, I couldn't go around the boy. I'd have to ask God to give me grace to be able to take it. Now, young people like that are fools when they do a thing like that. I don't see how that boy can live with his conscience. The rest of his days on the earth and he didn't seem to be too much worried about it now you have all kind of fools mentioned today even in the word of god there's atheistic fool in psalms chapter 14 verse 1 the fool said in his heart there is no god sometimes ago many years ago there's a preacher visited a beer tavern and when he walked in the door a young smart lick saw him come in got up on the uh, table and said there is no god there is no such thing as god that preacher walked up to him and looked at him and said, Man, he said, you must be a fool, sure enough. said, the Bible said, a fool has said in his heart there is no God, but here you don't have no more sense of blade that with your mouth. Now, beloved, listen to me. A person that says there is no God, God said that man is a fool. At any time you meet an atheist and he tries to tell you or she tries to tell you there's no God, just tell him I read about you in the Bible. God said you're a fool. And that's exactly what God said in this book. Then there's a self-righteous fool. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 26, He that trusted in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely shall be delivered. Now he's talking there about a self-righteous man that trusts in his own heart and his own good deeds and his own human efforts to get him to heaven. God said that person is a self-righteous fool. And you'd be surprised today to know the great number of self-righteous people in the land today that trust in their good, clean living, even trust in uh, their contributions, trust in their good morality, trust in their good deeds and being good neighbors and things of that type to get them to heaven. And God said they are foolish. They are foolish because they're self-righteous. And no self-righteous person can go to heaven depending upon that self-righteousness. The Bible said the heart is weak, you're desperate weak, and who can know it? And so if you're depending upon anything of human efforts to get you to heaven, then God said you're foolish. The only way you can go to heaven is trusting the shed blood of Jesus Christ, 
trusting in God's divine imputed righteousness that's produced by the shed blood of the Lamb. That's the only way. No other way can you make it. Now, if you're trusting in your own self-righteousness, then you're foolish. One of the hardest persons to win to God is a self-righteous individual. A person that thinks he's good enough, a person that thinks what he's doing, other than trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation, going to get him in. They are hard people to win to God. Not many of them ever won to God. Most of them die and go to hell. The Pharisees in the days of Jesus were a very Pharisaical group, self-righteous group, and they died without God. They wouldn't trust Jesus. They had more than 400 laws that set up for others, not really abiding by them themselves, but setting them up for others. And they trust in those laws to get them to heaven. They were self-righteous and died without God. And then we come to fool number three, and that's the materialistic fool that I read about in my text in Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 16. Here we have a man. He had been blessed and no doubt a healthy man. No doubt he was an intelligent man to a certain degree. And he was a wise farmer. And he had gone out and had planted his farm. And God had given him rain. God had given him sunshine. And God had blessed that man's crop. He had made a huge crop that year. And he was proud of what he had done. He began to brag about what I've done. He did one time take in consideration had not God given the rain, had not God given the sunshine and the right kind of climate and had uh, sprouted those seed he put in the ground and caused them to grow, he wouldn't have had anything. But he was bragging about what he had done. He said, I just want you to look at that crop I have out there. Man, I tell you, I know how to farm. Look what I've done. And he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns. And I'm going to build bigger barns. I'll build these bigger barns and I'll take this abundant crop. And I'll place this crop in those barns and I'll have food laid up for many years. And then he said, I'm going to say, soul, take it easy now. Eat, drink, and be merry. Have a good time because you have food laid up for many, many years to come. And while he was thinking about that, you know what God said? God said, you fool. Tonight your soul's going to be required of thee. Tonight you're going to die. Then what's going to happen to all these things, this great abundance of food and the big barns, what's going to happen to them? You're going to die tonight. Beloved, listen to me. If you're trusting in human efforts, if you're trusting in material things, tangible things, things that you accomplish here on the earth in order to please God and get you to heaven, God said you're a fool. If you have been blessed materially and financially and in any other way, you ought to thank God for that and bow humble before God Amen. and say, God, work not for you and your help and grace. I wouldn't have it. A lot of people are blessed above others in this respect. A lot of people have bigger bank accounts. A lot of people have more land. Some people have greater businesses. And a lot of people have stocks and bonds and been blessed beyond many other people that just don't have anything and live from week to week. Now, you shouldn't take a big head and strut down the street and, and act like uh, you're above everybody because of what you have. God can mighty easily uh, take care of you. God can mighty easily bring you right down to where you ought to be to straighten you out. God did that to old Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, I have uh, I built this great Babylon. I'm the strongest power in all the world. What a marvelous city I've built. I'm somebody. Nobody in the world greater than I am. You know what God said? The Bible said God let him, uh, God put him out in the grass, out in the field, and let him uh, go out like a cow eating grass. God brought him down and let his fingernails grow out like bird claws, his hairs grow out like bird feathers. And about, a, about seven years of that, no Nebuchadnezzar realized there's a God in heaven. He got a little bit too big for his britches. Now, the more God blesses you, the more humble you ought to be. Don't ever get too big for your britches and think you're somebody and nobody's quite as well off as you are. God can mighty easily bring you right down to the ground and make you humble. And so this man said, I'll build my barns, I'll store them full of food, I'll live a long time, and I'm going to really live her up. There's a lot of people that plan to enjoy the life in the old days and 
live it up and have a good income and everything laid away for a rainy day. And about time they got it squared away and got it all fixed up, they went out of this world. A lot of people have done that. You ought to consider God every day of your life and not just say, well, when I get old enough to retire and everything well fixed and then I'll consider God. Maybe too late then. There's a man one time, a wealthy man or had her somewhat of a kingdom and he had some good servants working for him and he had one fellow working for him that's kind of an ignorant kind of a fellow. And in his side especially, the man looked stupid and foolish. And he's looking at him one day and he said to this foolish looking man and he said, you know, you, you look like a idiot to me. I got an old walking stick here. He said, I want you to take this walking stick and you carry it with you everywhere you go until you find a person that's a greater fool than you are. Then you give him the stick. And so the poor old fellow took the stick and he kept it. And he kept it for a period of time. And his master grew old. And his master became very seriously ill. And his master came to the point of death. And he sent for the old servant to come. And the servant came in. And he still had that stick. And he talked with his master for a few minutes. And then he said to his master, he said, Sir, you have always enjoyed good health, haven't you? He said, Yes, I have, sir, but I sure have. He said, Well, you've been really blessed, haven't you? Yes, I have. You have lots and bonds and stocks and homes and mansions. Yes, I, I do have. I have all of that. And you've enjoyed the best of life. You've lived in luxury. Yeah, that's right, sir, but I, I really have. I'll have to admit I have. And you've lived your own life. You've done exactly what you wanted to do. Oh, yes, yes. I've enjoyed it. I've lived it up. He said, then you, now you come to the end of the way your health's gone. Yes, I'm sorry to tell you, sir, but my health's gone. It's really gone. And you come to the end of life's journey. He said, yes, I, I believe I have. That's what they say. I won't be here long. And he said, Master, sir, said, you won't be here long. And you're soon going to die. He said, that's right. That's what they say. I won't be here long. I'll soon be dead. And he said, now you have ignored God all your life. Yes, I have. And you come to die. Yes. And you don't know God. That's right. I don't know anything about God. He said, well, I'll tell you what. I want you to take this stick. You're the biggest fool I've met since the time you passed on to me. So I want you to take it back. And how true it is. A man that lived all of his life, enjoy the blessings of God Almighty, spend money God gave him to earn, enjoy God's sunshine, food, and water, enjoy good clothes to wear, a nice home to live in, good car to drive, and ignore God and spit in God's face and, and draw your smoke in and blow it in the face of God and come down to die without God, having done anything for God, you're one of the biggest fools that have walked in shoe leather. Beloved, listen to me. God said this man was a fool building his barns and and said, I'm going to uh, live the rest of my days and have a good time on my retirement and so forth. Now, you can't do that, Noah. God God may call your number. He knows your number. He knows where you live. He knows your house number, your phone number. God may call you most any time and say it's time to leave the world. So you better serve God day by day and don't play the fool. Then you have some careless fools in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now you can be careless. I, I meet careless fools every day tied up in some kind of cup. They are careless. They don't take time to search out the word of God. Or to hear a real true God called preacher preach the word of God. And they get ensnared in these cults. And they spend their days running around promoting that cult. And they are careless fools. They are too careless to search the scriptures. And find out what the Bible has to say. I understand there's a new Bible being put out now by the infidels and moderates and liberals and the devil behind it, of course. People saying, buy this Bible, they can understand it. No, you can't. That's not a Bible. That's been all butchered up. That's not a Bible. People that butchered up that and sell it to you just doing that to make money. The Bible said the natural man cannot understand the spiritual things. God, neither can he know them. They're spiritually discerned. And nobody, no sinner, can understand the word of God till he gets saved. I don't care who he is. Now, you can't understand this book. It's inspired by the Spirit of God. But the moment you get saved, God will begin to enlighten you so you can understand this Bible. You won't understand it all the first day, the first week, first month, first year. But you begin to understand this book when you get saved. Now, the devil, the liberals, the modernists, the infidel, and all that crowd are putting out these new Bibles. And all they're doing it for is to sell them, palm them off on poor, lost, religious people that know not God. Sell them to those people and they think they can understand that Bible. Well, that's not the Bible. 
The Bible is the Bible, and if they can understand it, it's not the Bible. Now, you better believe that. This book is made for God's people. You may say, Preacher Edwards, you mean to tell me that sinners don't understand the Bible? Only thing that sinner needs to understand is that he's lost, that he's going to hell if he don't get saved, that Jesus died for him, buried and rose again unless he repents, received Christ as saved, he's going to hell. That's all he needs to understand. And when he understands that and gets right with God, then he began to understand this book. Every promise in this Bible is made to God's people except the one that I just mentioned for that sinner. And so no sinner can understand the Bible. That's why they go after these uh, so-called new translations. They're lost. They think they understand it. They, they might understand that book, but that's not the Bible. And when they read it, they'll be no better off. Nobody gets saved by reading those books that's called the modern Bibles. Nobody. I never heard of anybody ever getting saved by reading one of these liberal, infidelic, modern Bibles that never have. This old King James Version is a book that God gave us, and you better stand by this book. Our forefathers came over here in about 1620, landed at Plymouth Rock, brought the Word of God, the Bible, the old King James Version, got out on their knees, dedicated themselves, and the, the new home, new land they came to, the God Almighty, and God founded this nation on the old King James Version, the old book of God. God saved nations. God saved revivals uh, through the preaching of this book. And this book has uh, stood the test over the years. And you better stay with the old King James Version. There's not a better translation in the world today. Amen. Stick by this book. Don't be a big fool while you buy one of these modern translations. Think you're going to learn something about God. You will know no more about God after you look at it than you did when you started. This book tells you about God. Then there's a sin marking fool. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9. Fools make a mark at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. The Bible says a fool makes a mark at sin. Have you ever heard anybody brag about how much liquor they could drink? Have you? That man's a fool. You ever heard anybody brag about how good they could drive on the influence of liquor? That man's a fool. You ever heard anybody brag about how uh, well they could drive under dope? That man's a fool. You ever hear a man brag about how many young girls' lives that he's run? That man's a fool. But let me listen to me. You can't go out here and brag about the sin you committed. If you do, you're a fool. Only fools brag about committing sin. Foolish people. Now, people are not foolish are not going to brag about the sins they committed. They're going to feel bad about it. They, they're going to be humble about it. They're going to ask God to forgive them. They're not going around and crow about it and brag about it. Now, we find that sins mock fools and then... Uh, you have the sin mocking fool, and then you have sin mocking the fool. Now, many times, sin have promised great things. There's a man went into a place one time, and he saw $10,000. And somebody said to him, said, go ahead and take that. The devil is what said it to him. Go ahead, and you can take that $10,000, and you'll never get caught. And he kept looking, well, should I take that $10,000? And finally, the devil uh, gained the victory, and the man reached down, and took the $10,000. He was caught a few, year, a few days later, and they gave him 10 years in prison. Now, as he was there looking at the $10,000, he didn't see the 10 years in prison. Now, the devil hid that from him. The devil didn't want him to see that. The devil wanted him to see the $10,000, but not the 10 years in prison. And for 10 long years, that man had to serve a stealing $10,000. Man wrote me some time ago that's in prison. Now, I forget the amount of money he robbed and, and took this money from an elder lady, I believe. I believe it's about uh, 40-something dollars. And he's done served over, I believe he said, 17 years for that money and got no hope of getting out yet. Now, that's pathetic, isn't it? Oh, dear people, listen to me. The devil never shows you the bad side of anything. He wants to make a fool out of you. He made a fool out of Eve and Adam. He made a fool out of Judas his carrot. He made a fool out of the prodigal son. Of course, we know that's a story, a parable. But the devil will make a fool out of you and then laugh about it whenever you come to the end of life's journey and realize that you've broken your health, that you're going to die, and you haven't done anything for God. Standing in the service one time, the old gray-headed man stood up and tears running down his cheeks, only been saved just a short period of time. And he was crying. He said, people, you may wonder why I'm crying. He said, I'm so happy that I'm saved. But say, what I'm crying about is I wasted my entire life. I haven't done anything for God. I've only been saved just a few weeks. I'm an old man. I'll soon be dead. It breaks my heart. I've done nothing for God. And he just, he shook with sobs. 
And he was sincere. And that man died shortly after that, and I preached his funeral. Beloved, listen to me. If you're going to do anything for God, you better be doing it. You're not getting any younger. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. This thing's finally going to wind up one of these days, and you better get busy. There's coming a time when God's going to mock that foolish man that goes on his foolish way and fails to do what he should. Let me give you these verses in closing. In Proverbs chapter 1, verses 24 through 29, Because I've called and you refuse, I stretched out my hand no man regarded, but you said in order all my counsel, you wouldn't know my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh, there's desolation. And when your destruction cometh, there's a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Beloved, it's a foolish thing to go on without God. Depend upon human efforts and material things. And go on and be a fool in this life dying without God. One of the most foolish things any man's ever done is gamble, gamble, gamble with his soul and die without God. How foolish, how foolish, how foolish. I have this message on this on concept tape as well as this singing this morning. It's tape number 154. If anybody's interested in this particular tape in the radio listening audience in this auditorium, the tape is 154, entitled Some Fools in God's Sight, and it's available. And I hope if you're interested, you'll get in touch with me. You've listened well today, and if you're not saved, you ought to get right with God. There may be somebody here today that's unsaved, and you're moving on without God. People are being killed. Fine, precious young man out here uh, at the power company last week on his job working, and all of a sudden... Uh, Cable hit him or something happened and killed him instantly. I understand he was a Christian and knew God and loved the Lord, but he was there doing his job. He, he didn't dream that his time had come, and all of a sudden he gone just like that. Left a wife, and I believe somebody said some children. We don't know. We may be sitting here today, and something like that happened, and we're gone. If you're not ready to meet God, it's a sad situation. And I hope that you won't be so foolish as to use all your time for yourself, all your means for yourself, and live without God and come to the end of life's journey and have to bow your head realizing you have played the fool. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today you'll take the message and use it to thy glory. May thy name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. God, there may be somebody in this auditorium that's unsaved. I pray that they won't rest ere they come to know thee. There may be somebody, Father, in the radio listening audience that need thee. I pray that this will be the time that they'll do something about that. Now, Father, have your way and lead us and guide and direct in this invitation. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Debbie's playing for us. Now, listen to me. She's going to play a couple of stanzas on the organ. If you're here and you're unsaved or backslidden and you want to join the church, you need to come forward for any reason. I want you to feel free to come while she plays. You and you alone know whether you ought to come and it's up to you. I preach. I've done what God told me to do and it's up to you to do what God tells you to do. How about it? 